uh, an honor to be in the uh, Duncan Luce conference room, but especially an honor to be here in, in, on this occasion. So Jean-Claude, uh, my best wishes and happy birthday. And How did you get that? <laughs> I will try not to embarrass you too much. But I, you know, Jean-Claude was uh, a speaker at my birthday party a long time ago, as was Don. Uh, so I, I have a chance to get even. <laughs> so uh, what I want to talk about is, is something that um, I've gotten interested in, and that is to take these ideas which start in the physical sciences, have gone over to the social and behavioral sciences, and now have potential uses in other disciplines. And so I actually have gotten interested in applying notions of meaningfulness and measurement theory in areas like landscape ecology, <laughs> and, which I'm not going to talk about today, uh, and in epidemiology, which I am going to talk about today. And there is kind of a confluence here of lots of disciplines, but this seems to be the way science is moving now. And so what I want to do is, is, is uh, spend a lot of time talking and giving you a variety of examples. So as, as Don has threatened, I will. But I, I will step backwards and say, you know, many people talk about and make meaningless statements. At least I put it in my title. <laughs> so so uh, here are some of the things I'm going to ask. So is it meaningful to say that the malaria parasite load has doubled? Now, we score people's coughs, that's in a quite subjective way, uh, and with uh, diseases like tuberculosis. And so the question is, if you have the average cough score for one set of patients and compare it to the average cough score of another set of patients, is it meaningful to say that the first set of patients has a higher average cough score? So I'm also going to talk about HIV. And, and talk about which of the different methods that we might uh, use to control the spread of HIV might be more effective, and, and how can you measure the effectiveness and decide and make comparisons. So all of these questions have something to do with measurement, and I hope I'm going to be able to convince you of that. And, uh, and, and let, me, let me give you an outline, and I'm not going to get to everything here because Don told me I couldn't have three hours. <laughs> so, uh, but it's going to take longer than I originally planned because I wanted to make sure I embarrassed Jean-Claude by talking a little bit about some of his work. So, uh, and I will work that in in a couple of places. So I'm going to talk about measurement theory very briefly and what it is, and, and meaningfulness as, uh, will be defined in various ways. I'm going to talk about uh, some specific examples. So we'll talk about cough severity, I'll talk about air pollution, uh, I'll talk about HIV, as I said, but also to, if I have time, I'll talk about optimization problems in epidemiology, and I doubt I'm going to get to much of the rest, but maybe I'll at least give you a hint of where some of the behavioral responses to health events will need the intervention of behavioral scientists who know something about measurement. So, uh, what is measurement? It has something to do with numbers, and uh, I'm going to take the approach of the representational theory of measurement, which goes back to Luce and Supis and others. And of course, it, it's important to point out the important things that Jean-Claude has done as in the way of contributions. And I, I remember an early paper of yours, Jean-Claude, that had to do with composite measurement. Uh, I think that's how I first found out about what you, what you were doing. Uh, but I, I've enjoyed over the years uh, your work on by orders and graded families of relations and all these other things that really have contributed to the development of the notion, the fundamental ideas of measurement theory. So. Uh, important for me. So what is measurement? It, it, we, we think of assigning numbers to objects in such a way that certain things are, are, that we observe are preserved. So in health, we look a lot at things like temperature and weight, just like they do in physics. Uh, 
with temperature, we're trying to observe, uh, preserve a relationship, a warmer than relationship. And with weight, we're trying to preserve a relationship with heavier than. So those are things, you, those are empirical relationships that you can observe. And uh, the, the representational theory of measurement says something like the following. You have a set of objects, you have a binary relation on that set of objects. So that binary relation could be warmer than, it could be heavier than. And then we want to assign numbers to the objects in such a way that you, re you preserve those relationships in certain ways. You reflect the relation on the objects that you're interested in with another relation on the numbers. So the simplest way of here is to simply say, well, I guess the, the pointer <coughs> will work. So we're saying that A is warmer than B if and only if it gets a higher number than B. That's the very simple way to look at it. You could think of preference. Certainly loudness enters into uh, measuring how severe a cough is. And so some of these ideas from psychophysics are relevant uh, as well in the things I'm going to talk about. So actually, with, uh, with weight, there's more going on because you can combine the weight of this with the weight of this. And you can talk about the weight of the combined objects and weight. We want it to be additive. And we get into the theory of extensive measurement and extensive properties, all things I won't talk about. In fact, I'm not going to talk about any of this very much, except I will talk about this generalization, generalized idea of a homomorphism. Uh, and I know Lewis was talking about isomorphisms. I like to talk about homomorphisms uh, just as a way of assigning numbers to objects that preserve all of the relations and operations that you are interested in. Uh, I'm going to be sloppy, and I'll think of a homomorphism as just an acceptable way to assign numbers. And I'm going to be interested in how you transform one homomorphism into another, so how you transform one acceptable way of measuring things into another. And if you want to make this precise, you can talk about an empirical relational system and a numerical relational system and a homomorphism that maps one into the other and that, that, that preserves everything in sight. So I know a lot of you have seen all this stuff. I'm not going to use it very much, so I'm going to go rather rapidly through this, this type of stuff. So let's talk about how unique such a scale of measurement might be. And we know. And Don started with the being twice as warm as it was in the East Coast, and that wasn't fair. <laughs> uh, it was wind chill of about 10 degrees when I left. It's minus 40. I'd love to see it. Yeah, OK, thanks. <laughs> uh, so now I don't feel so bad about being here. Anyway, so you know, we talked about um, uh, whether you measure it in cent centigrade or in Fahrenheit makes a big difference. Um, uh, when you're talking about weighing somebody, whether you describe their weight in kilograms or in pounds or in ounces or in grams or whatever, that makes a big difference too. So we transform one scale into another, and we'll call that an admissible transformation. And most cases we can think of an admissible transformation as just defined on the range of a homomorphism. Uh, but if I'm sloppy, I'm not going to worry too much about that. But uh, at least at the beginning, I'll try not to be sloppy, and I'll talk about a function that phi defined on the range of the homomorphism f into whatever the mirror uh, relational system is. And I'll call that an admissible transformation if, again, phi uh, composed on f is a homomorphism. So uh, <coughs> the obvious ones for centigrade into Fahrenheit, <coughs> for kilograms into pounds. Uh, and we mentioned, Lewis mentions uh, Stevens a lot. <laughs> and Steve, we all uh, live on the shoulders of people. <laughs> and Stevens is one of the people whose shoulders we live on if we do measurement theory. So this whole idea of how the class of admissible transformations will define the scale type, we owe him. So uh, we talk about ratio scales, where the class of admissible transformations are the similarities, where you can multiply by a positive constant. We talk about interval scales, where the class allows you to multiply by a positive constant and add another one. So that changes the unit and the zero point. And we talk about uh, ordinal 
scales where any strictly increasing function is an admissible transformation. And we talk about uh, absolute scales where only the identity is an admissible transformation. Uh, obviously, something I messed up here with my word judgments, which should have been over on the right side, but I'll fix that later. <laughs> So let's talk about meaningful statements. So and here's where I'm going to start giving you some examples. So one of the definitions that, go, that I, I like, because it goes all the way back to Supis and Zinnis, and actually the Pat Supis in, in the late 50s, is uh, captures the idea that a statement is meaningful if its truth or falsity is not an artifact of the particular choice of scale that you used. And so uh, the way that was formalized by Supis and Zinnis was to say that if you have a statement that involves numerical scales, so scales where you assign numbers, uh, it is meaningful if its truth or falsity is unchanged after any or all of the scales in question is transformed by an admissible transformation. And I put independently with a question mark, and I'll give you examples where that becomes an issue. OK, well, that sounds like a nice definition. It was widely used in measurement theory, and still is. Um, it turns out that sometimes you can't apply that definition because there are uh, situations where you cannot get one scale from another by an admissible transformation. And that actually is the case sometimes when you look at semi-orders and judgments of louder than and so on. And you cannot get one scale from another by an admissible transformation. You have two acceptable scales, and, and you cannot go there from one to the other. So in that case, you get an even more informal definition. And that simply says that a statement is, that involves numerical scales is meaningful if its truth or falsity is unchanged after any or all of the scales in question is replaced or replaced by another acceptable scale. And again, I ask whether that's done independently or not. So that's a very informal definition. It actually is the definition I'm going to use. Uh, now, I go back to one of the papers that Lewis mentioned, uh, which is a very influential paper and which I'm going to totally disregard <laughs> in this presentation. But it certainly raises issues about that informal definition. Uh, it points out how imprecise it is. It points out that it wasn't clear uh, what the term involving numerical scales means. Uh, and it points out that scales can be involved in the statement in more than one way. Uh, it points out that meaningfulness may not just be a property of a relation, but a property of a family of relations. And it gave rise to a really beautiful theory of families of numerical codes and various kinds of meaningfulness. I will go back to that in a little while. Uh, that also was extended in a fundamental paper that John Claude wrote uh, almost 10 years ago now. <laughs> uh, that appeared in the Foundations of Physics, and it builds on this fundamental possible psychophysical laws uh, of Duncan's, which I now like to refer to as possible scientific laws because it's much more general than just psychophysics. So, OK. So nevertheless, uh, I'm going to adopt this very informal definition, and I'm going to go through a whole bunch of examples from epidemiology to convince you that this is an interesting idea that a lot of people don't seem to understand, and where there is a confluence of the things that uh, social and behavioral scientists have done that might be useful in other disciplines. So let's start with this uh, statement. Uh, so. Uh, I'm also interested in diseases of animals, so <laughs> I had to bring that one in. Okay, so is that a meaningful statement to say this talk will be three times as long as the next one? Next one is lunch, I guess. So, <laughs> uh, so we have a ratio scale. We're talking about time intervals. So we're talking about something measured in minutes or hours or seconds, eons, <laughs> decades. Uh, so and we're saying that f of a is three times f of b. 
So if we have a ratio scale, uh, that's a meaningful statement. Because you have an admissible transformation means multiply x by alpha, a positive number. And you want f of a to be 3f of b if and only if, uh, when you apply that admissible transformation, the truth of the statement is unchanged. And so, of course, because admissible transformations are just multiplication by alpha, uh, 1 and 3 are equivalent. And so 1 is considered meaningful if you use this informal definition of adopting. OK. So let's look at temperature then. So now we get into a, a, an epidemiological question, or a public health question, or a medical question. So the patient's temperature today at 9 a.m. is 2% higher than it was at 9 a.m. yesterday. And of course, we've already had Dom show us that that's not a meaningful statement. Uh, that's the same as saying it's twice as big, or that in this case, 1.2 times as big, or 1.02 times as big. And it could be true with Fahrenheit and false with centigrade, or vice versa. Would it be true with absolute temperature? Uh, you're getting too complicated, but yes. <laughs> so in general, uh, it's meaningful to compare <laughs> ratios if you have a ratio scale. And in general, it's uh, meaningful to compare intervals if you have an interval scale. And in if it's ordinal, you can compare size. Those are all meaningful types of comparisons. Let's look at malaria. So malaria parasite density is still uh, judged rather um, informally by actually people physically reading slides under a microscope. But uh, can you actually claim that the parasite density in one slide is double the parasite density in another? <laughs> so is that a meaningful statement? So soon I'm going to make you take votes on these things. But, uh, <laughs> This one is pretty simple because density is measured in number per microliter. So if one slide has 100,000 per microliter and another one has 50,000, uh, is it meaningful to say that the first slide has twice the density of the second? And of course, everything here is ratio, right? So except for counting, which is absolute. <laughs> And so uh, whether you measure it in microliters or liters doesn't really matter. So it is a meaningful statement. But that disregards the errors in measurement, because this is still done very informally. And so a main point here I want to make is that a statement can be meaningful, but meaningless in practice. And again, here I, I should mention that Jean-Claude, I think, has done more than anyone else to give a theoretical account of me errors in measurement. So I go back to some of his his work on probabilistic representations, and I remember many interesting conversations about that, and random versions of different kinds of, uh, of classical measurement theories, like extensive measurement and conjoint measurement and so on. So very important to distinguish practical meaningfulness from theoretical meaningfulness. OK, here's another one. I told you I was into animal diseases, so I weigh a thousand times what that elephant weighs. Is that a meaningful statement? Let's take a show of hands on that one. How many thinks it, it's meaningful? How many think it's not? No, nobody dared say no. <laughs> um, so look, this is the ratio scales. It's hopefully false. I know I've been dieting. <laughs> no matter what the unit is. So the, the next important point is that meaningfulness is different from truth. So it has to do with the kinds of assertions that you feel comfortable making and which can be made by somebody else looking at the same data. And can be made, uh, they're not accidents of the particular choice of units that you might use, <laughs> for instance. Uh, again, I, I point to uh, the uh, Falmanio Naren's paper, where they have a lo lovely discussion of the, the statement that says the ratio of Stendhal's weight to Jane Austen's on July 3rd, 1914, was 1.42. So, <laughs> fun to read that one. <laughs> I don't know where you came up with those two names. Was that? <laughs> we came up with 1.42. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, 
a couple of an aside here. So let's talk about this statement. I weigh a thousand times what the elephant weighs. Um, so you have a particular scale that's been used to measure weight, but that scale is not mentioned in the statement. So uh, it, it, you can assume the initial scaling has been done, say, within pounds, if you want. But now, uh, Falmania and Nerens offer several interpretations of the meaningfulness of this and what the what, what, what's going on. So one interpretation is to say that a sentence defines a numerical relation, T of AX. Uh, that, that, that relation is that A is my weight, X is the elephant's weight, and the ratio between those two weights is 1,000. So that sentence is a meaningful sentence because no matter what transformation you use, uh, well, no matter what transformation F you use, uh, the statement remains true after you replace A by F of A and X by F of X. However, uh, what if you think of meaningfulness not as a, a, a property of a particular statement, but of a property of a family of statements or a family of relations? So now uh, you could subscript the statement by the particular scale or homomorphism that you used. I'll talk about T sub F AX. Uh, that means that A is my weight, X is the elephant's weight, and both are measured on the scale F, and the ratio is 1,000. And now you'd like to think that for every F, so first of all, now we're talking about a ternary relation, not a binary relation. And so it's clear that this is a different way of looking at things. But also now you can think of the statement uh, and comparing using different f's. So you have an f and a g, and you'd want t sub f of f, a, f of a, f of x to be equivalent to t sub g of g of a and g of x. And of course, in this case, since everything is, uh, is a ratio, that's also true. So both of, so, so you have meaningfulness in both senses. The individual statement is meaningful, but also the whole family of statements is meaningful as well. But that's not always the case. So just to give you a simple example, uh, suppose I fix an initial ratio scale, and then so every f, every little f, is obtained from the initial capital F by multiplying by some positive constant. And now let's fix a constant k and let the statement be t of ax says a is x plus k. And now one interpretation of this statement uh, is simply that says, you know, when I measure a and I measure x, and then I, and, and the difference between them is this constant. And of course that's, uh, if I have a ratio scale, that may be true <laughs> With, uh, with pounds and false with ounces. So that is not a, a meaningful statement. And uh, to use the terminology of Feldman and Nerens, that, that is a statement that is meaningless in the first sense. OK, but now let's look at a whole, at, at, at where the, what, what's the purpose of this k? And maybe k depends on f. It really depends on the choice of scale. And you should look at the statement as now subscripted by f and look at the whole family of statements. And now you might want to consider meaningfulness in the second sense. And now, if in the simplest case where the k of lambda f is lambda k of f, it's easy <coughs> enough to show that all of these statements are true. And so we have a whole family of relations for which that statement is true for each of them. And so in this sense, we have meaningfulness in a second sense. And so we had something which was meaningless in the first sense and meaningful in the second. And that's all by way of an aside, because I'm not going to pay any attention to this difficulty. <laughs> OK. So let's get to the epidemiology. So let's say I have two groups of patients with tuberculosis. And F of A is the cough severity of a particular patient as judged on one of the subjective scales that they use, they're usually a, 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 a scale of one to five. 
Now let's say the data suggests that the average cough severity for patients in the first group is higher than the average cough severity of patients in the second group. And let's uh, denote the patients in the first group by A1 up to AN, and those in the second group by B1 up to BM. Those N and M don't have to be the same. And so we're really taking the arithmetic mean <coughs> of the cough severity of the people in the first group and saying that's higher than the arithmetic mean of the cough severity of the people in the second group. How many think that's a meaningful statement? <laughs> Can't get anyone to commit themselves. We have one. Anyone? Two. What, what, uh, how many think it's not meaningful? Well, the answer is none of you know because I didn't tell you what kind of a scale, uh, what properties of this scale has, so the answer depends on it. So let's look at an admissible, I don't know what an admissible transformation of scale phi is, but after I compose phi on f on both sides, I should get this statement, and I want the first statement, <coughs> this one, to be true if and only if this one is true. So if we had a ratio scale of cough severity, if we had a ratio scale of cough severity, then that just means multiply everything by alpha, and the alphas go away, and of course, the first one and this one are equivalent. So if you had a ratio scale of cough severity, then making the comparison, the average cough severity of one group is higher than the average cough severity of another group, is a meaningful statement. So it would work if this were not comparing cough severity, but we're comparing, say, the, the, the average weight of the patients in one group to the average weight of the patients in another group. So now, it turns out it's still meaningful to make this comparison if f is an interval scale. So you can go through the, the arithmetic a little bit. The betas go away, the alphas go away, and, and so uh, we still have meaningfulness if you can compare uh, the average of something measured on the interval scale. Unfortunately, probably cough severity is just an ordinal scale, and unfortunately, this is not a meaningful comparison if you just have an ordinal scale. And, uh, so, and, and uh, I think you can probably make up a simple example like I did, which has five, a five-point scale, and one group has a five, three, and a one in it with an average of three, and the second group has a four, four, and two with an average of 3.33. Well, now if I simply, and that tells me that the first, second group has a higher average cough severity, but if, I, if this is only an ordinal scale, then I can make any transformation that keeps the numbers in the same order, and I now use 175, 65, 40, and 30, and now the first group gets an average of 65 and the second an average of 63.33, and now I have to say that the first group has a higher average score. So if you just have an ordinal scale, then you cannot conclude in a meaningful way that one group has a higher average than another. Uh, of course, you might argue that the five-point scale has more properties like even spacedness or something like that, in which case you don't allow just any old monotone increase in transformation. Uh, but uh, that gets into a much more subtle set of arguments. The main thing I want to say is if you want to compare medians, then you can do that if you have an ordinal scale. Okay, so uh, fatigue is another uh, measure that's used often in public health. So average fatigue is measured on the Piper scale, and it's a scale of 1 to 10. And you might ask, uh, so to what degree is fatigue interfering with your ability to do your work? Or how severe do you think it is? And you can do the same analysis with the Piper scale. And again, it's, it's meaningless to compare means, uh, probably, with a scale like this, because it's probably just ordinal and is meaningful to compare medians. Uh, Let's get to a, a second example now. Let's do this a little differently. Each of N observers is asked <coughs> to rate each of a collection of patients as to their relative cough severity. So uh, before, it was one observer. 
Now each observer is doing it. Uh, and let f sub i of a be the rating of patient A by the, the ith rater. So is it meaningful to assert that the average rating of patient A is higher than the average rating of patient B? Any, any thoughts about that? Nobody's willing to say no. <laughs> OK. Um, so you might get the same question if you rate the uh, fatigue, you may rate how bad somebody's rash is, et cetera, et cetera. So here we're looking at the ith person's rating of patient A, adding them up and dividing by the number of patients. And here we're looking at the ith person's rating of B, adding them up and dividing by the number of patients. And, and here it's the same N in both cases because it's the number of patients that's N, uh, uh, number of raters that's N, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and we're comparing two patients. Now, if each rater measures things on a ratio scale, if that could be done, then this would be a meaningful comparison. But there's a problem with jumping to that conclusion, because here we have this business of independent. Remember in my definition I said you could change, maybe change the scales uh, to other acceptable scales independently. So it's possible that each of the raters might have independent units. Um, and, and so we might want to allow different alphas. And now we'd have to say, let's compare the sum of alpha i f of a divided by n to the sum of alpha i f of b divided by n. And it's easy to see that you can cook up the alphas. So, one, so it might be. Uh, true without the alphas and false with the alphas. So, so if the, uh, the individual raters can use different units, then even with ratio scales, you don't have a meaningful comparison. So for instance, uh, I don't know how UCI picks its um, soccer team. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Which one are you going for? Uh, <laughs> All um, resemblance to people living or dead is pure coincidence. Uh, maybe I choose them by their weight, because I think they can crush the opponent. And you choose them by their height, because they can do a header over anybody else's head. And so now, uh, the average of our scores of a potential recruit is going to be the, the, the average of their height and weight. And this is an example where even though height and weight are measured on ratio scales, averaging them and comparing the averages is, is a meaningless comparison. So if you want to, you can go back to the uh, Feldmanian Nerens discussion where they do very similar things, where they have n different uh, scales and you want to compare uh, statements where you might change all of those scales independently to others. Yeah. Okay, so conclusion. Be careful when comparing arithmetic mean ratings. Uh, it actually turns out, my, my former colleague Norm Dolke pointed out that even if you were to use different uh, scales for the different experts, comparing geometric mean is actually meaningful. And that's because you're multiplying all the alphas, and the alphas go away. <laughs> and so, uh, so even if individuals can change their cough severity ratings, or uh, if some of them are measuring uh, weight on, with ounces and others with pounds, and others with grams, uh, you still have meaningful comparison if you compare geometric means. So sometimes it's safer to do that. Uh, I actually did that uh, when I was doing a study of air pollution in San Diego back when I worked at the Rand Corporation in the early 70s. And there we used magnitude estimation to look at the factors, the variables relevant to air pollution. And we were getting the expert rating of the best, most important uh, factors with 100 and others if it was half as important with a 50 and so on. So 
uh, and we knew that the average using arithmetic means was not necessarily going to be good, and so we used geometric means, and we uh, took the data and we used, compared geometric means, and that was uh, Norm Dolke influenced me at that point to do that. Okay. So let's talk about, since I got into air pollution, and it is, at least you have nice clear skies today. Um, so there's a close relationship between pollution and health and various pollutants in the air, uh, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, and who knows what else is in Southern California since I left this part of the world. But uh, some pollutants are more serious in the presence of others, et cetera. So there's long been a goal of measuring pollution with one overall measure. So uh, a single measure could give you just an indication, just like a temperature today or, or, the, or the, uh, how cold we feel and so on and so forth. How bad is the air today? So at the, in the early days of air pollution measurement, they wanted to measure the total weight of emissions of a given pollutant I over a fixed period of time and summed it over all I. And so E of ITK is the total weight of emissions of pollutant I, say per cubic meter, over the teeth time period and due to the kth source or measured in the kth location. And if you um, sum that up over all I, you get what I call ATK. Okay. So when you do that, so you're measuring the total weight of emissions, uh, you get conclusions like this. Transportation is the largest source of air pollution, uh, with stationary fuel combustion second largest. Transportation, transportation accounts for over half of all air pollution, and carbon monoxide accounts for, for over half of all emitted air pollution. So are these meaningful conclusions? So let's look at the first one. So that just says that uh, the total sum of the emissions due to uh, transportation is larger than uh, any of the others. And so for the, if k is the transportation one and k prime is any of the others, a of tk is bigger than a of tk prime, the total weight of emissions. Second thing says transportation accounts for over 50% of all air pollution. So that says if you take a particular case of R, total weight of emissions due to that, compare it to the sum of total weight of emissions over all the K is different from K sub R, you want to make that claim. And last one is carbon monoxide accounts for over half of all emitted air pollution. That just says if you sum over all T and K, but fix I, of the E of I, T, K. And it, now you sum the E of J, T, Ks over all Js different from carbon monoxide and sum over all Ts and Ks. Well, this number is bigger than all the rest added up. So are these meaningful conclusions? Well, everything in question is, a, uh, is, uh, you know, is measured in mass and, and so uh, admissible transformation multiplies everything by the same constant, and it's easy to see that all of these are meaningful statements. But are they really meaningful in a practical sense? Remember, I made this comment about comparing practice and, and whatever. Jean-Claude is shaking his head. <laughs> Clearly, uh, a unit of mass of one pollutant is not necessarily as harmful as a unit of mass of another. So carbon monoxide is much less harmful in terms of mass than the same uh, unit of mass of, of, of nitrogen oxides, for instance. So that suggests weighting things by tolerance factors. Or so you, you take a look at, at, at the measure at which you will have a toxicity effect, and you compare that to the measure at which you'll have a toxicity effect for, say, carbon monoxide, and now you would take a, uh, that as a degree of hazard and weight all of the sums by one over that. <laughs> and so now that was actually introduced in the Bay Area using a measure called PINDEX. And you got conclusions uh, like 
uh, transportation is still the largest source of pollutants, but now accounts for less than half. And stationary sources, which were second, falls to fourth, and carbon monoxide falls to the bottom of the list and only accounts for 2% of the total. Um, they're all meaningful, but again, are those meaningful in a practical sense? So uh, what PINDEX does, it says you take the percentage of a given harmful level of emissions that's reached in a given period of time, you add up those percentage over all the pollutants, and notice the sum can be more than 100%. Uh, but the problem is, so you can get to 100% uh, it, by having 100% of the toxicity level of carbon monoxide. And then you're in bad shape. But you can also get to 100% by having 20% of carbon monoxide's toxicity level and 20% of nitrogen oxide's toxicity level, and so on and so forth. And now, maybe that's not so bad. So that's why PINDEX is nonsense, even though it makes, it's meaningful to make the comparison. So it's important to make that distinction. OK, so let me skip to. HIV. So how do you evaluate alternative possible treatment plans for any given disease? So one way to do it is to take different criteria or benchmarks, and this may not be just treatment for disease, it may be uh, any kind of intervention you're interested in studying. Uh, it might be for a new uh, type of uh, equipment you're, you want to buy, you measure them on different criteria or a benchmark, you score them, and then you try to do something with the scores. You score each treatment on each criteria. You, one thing that's very frequently done is you take one of the treatments as your base, and you normalize the scores relative to the score of that treatment. And then you average those normalized scores, very commonly done. So if the averaging is the arithmetic mean, well, let's see what happens. So let's do some particular examples. So in HIV, you might be considering universal screening or giving free condoms away or circumcising males and so on and so forth. Uh, and you might want to look at different criteria or outcomes, like what happens to the CD4 count, how many days are you without a symptom, and so on and so forth. So here's my, my results. I evaluate three treatments, R, M, and Z, on five criteria, E, F, G, and H, and I. And these are the scores. It doesn't matter what the numbers mean. Okay. These are the scores. So these are, the scores actually were taken from a real example, but I'll tell you later what the real example is. So now what we do is we pick one of the treatments, in this case R, and we normalize all the scores relative to the score of that treatment. So 244 divided by the score of R gives me 0 0.59. And uh, 369 divided by 772 gives me 0.45. So I've normalized all of the scores relative to the score of treatment R. Now the next thing I do is I calculate the arithmetic mean, and, I, uh, uh, and those are the numbers in the right-hand column. And now what's the conclusion? The conclusion is the treatment Z has the highest average normalized score, and so that's the best one. Is that meaningful? <laughs> well, let's look what happens if I normalize instead relative to uh, treatment M. So I pick M as my base. And so the, the, the 1.71 is the ratio between 417 and 244. And now I calculate arithmetic means. And now uh, which one is the best? All of a sudden, I conclude that treatment R is the best. So the whole thing was meaningless. And uh, you have to worry about doing this. As it turns out, this was actually a real example, but not from HIV. It comes from a computing machine example where the issue was choosing which of different computing devices to invest in and testing them on different benchmarks. But it was real data that appeared in a real 
journal article. <laughs> and um, it turns out, however, that if you were to use geometric means, now let me do this again. First I normalize with respect to treatment R, and now the highest geometric mean score is R's. And now I'm normalizing with respect to treatment M, and the highest one is still treatment R's, and that's no accident. And you can actually prove that with the geometric mean, this normalization is fine, and you get a meaningful comparison. Uh, and it's even meaningful to say that the given treatment has a 20% higher score, average normalized score, than another one. And there's some literature, of a nice paper by Fleming and Wallace that gives general conditions under which comparing uh, no geometric means of normalized scores is a meaningful comparison. And I guess the message is here, don't average things without knowing what you're doing. <laughs> um, uh, Lewis was kind enough to list some papers that I did with Janusz Excel and Sam Rosenbaum, and, uh, and we actually gave some conditions that I think in the interest of time I'm going to skip that show some cases where you get the geometric mean and some where you get the arithmetic mean if you're trying to look at abstract conditions under which uh, you would derive one or the other. But I'd rather get into the optimization question. And so my, the work on optimization that I got interested in resulted partly from climate change and from the issues about heat events. So heat events are of particular interest to the uh, CDC. The CDC formed a, um, a mathematical modeling group, and they wanted some sample problems to challenge the modeling group on, and heat events were one of the three sample problems that they took. And partly that was motivated by some major heat events in Chicago and in Europe. Um, what we're interested in is the result on health of, of a major heat event. And in particular, we're interested in evacuation modeling. And the question is, where do you locate evacuation centers? And who do you send where? And how do you keep travel time down? And, and how do you get facilities to uh, not exceed their maximum capacity, and so on and so forth. So in that problem, we had to find the shortest route from home to an evacuation center. And uh, that is the shortest path problem. So it's a problem that is actually widely studied, so widely studied that my friends at the Department of Transportation tell me that they use the shortest path algorithm literally a billion times a year or more. So here's a simple network. X, Y, and Z are the nodes of the network, and these are the weights on the edges. And what's the shortest path from X to Z? Anybody want to take a guess? Assume those take, are the times it takes you to traverse those edges. What's the shortest path from X to Z? Nobody willing to say? My, you know, uh, <laughs> certainly 2 plus 4 is less than 15. So I think I, I'd be tempted to say that the shortest path from x to z is the path going x to y to z. Everybody happy with that? Is that a meaningful conclusion? No votes. I think I've got you all scared now. <laughs> okay. uh, well, uh, in the example I've given where this is the time it takes, or the distance, sorry, the distance, the numbers define a ratio scale. So certainly if you multiply everything uh, by a positive constant, it's still going to be uh, the shortest path goes from x to y to z. But what if these are on an interval scale? What if they measure your disutility of having to go from x, uh, along that edge? And now, if I could uh, take the transformation, say, uh, change the unit by 3 and add 100, what happens? What's the shortest path from x to z? It changed. 
and it changed. Uh, and so it was a meaningless conclusion to say that the shortest path from x to z is to go via y. Now, how many people ever thought of that at the Department of Transportation when they used this algorithm a billion times a year? And how many people ever thought of that when they do shortest path in other applications? Now, it's worse than that, because shortest path problem can be formulated as a linear programming problem. And to make the statement that A is the solution to a linear programming problem, in other words, it gives you the optimal solution, can be a meaningless statement, in particular if the parameters are measured on an interval scale. Now, linear programming is used by every major company and every major government agency all over the world, and I venture to say nobody thinks about the meaningfulness of conclusions that they get. Okay. And certainly in epidemiology, we use it widely. So, one more example. And I know I'm standing between you and lunch. So, what's a spanning tree? You have a network with numbers on the edges. A spanning tree is a tree, so that's a set of edges that connects everything up, but doesn't, uh, but it's as small as possible. And you want to find a minimum spanning tree, one where the sum of the weights on the edges is as small as possible. So this is what, I, in red, we get a minimum spanning tree. So you'll see everything you can get from any place to any other place by following those edges, and, that, and if you move any one of them, you can't do it anymore. Now this happens to be the, there are lots of spanning trees. The one where the sum of the weights is as small as possible is the one I've shown you. And there's an algorithm for finding these. So how did these come up in our problem? Well, first of all, I ask you, is it meaningful to say that this is the minimum spanning tree in this network? Now all of you are gonna be too scared to give me an answer. You think it is? Okay. Don't give away. <laughs> I want some people at least to be wondering. So we actually looked at this because we looked at emergencies and with climate changing there might be more floods and hurricanes and whatever and we wanted to find a way to find the minimum spanning tree which would give you the, a way to keep to be able to go from any place to any other place. So what if this were interval scales? And I, I make the same transformation I had before, 3x plus 100. I get these numbers. And those of you who remember what the other minimum spanning tree was, you'll see we got the same minimum spanning tree as I had before. And is that an accident? And the answer is uh, no, because the algorithm that gets you the minimum spanning tree is due to Kruskal. And his algorithm says you, you, you order the edges by increasing order of weight. You pick one, then you pick another one, and keep doing that until you can't pick anymore without getting something that's not a tree. So you throw that one away and you pick the next one. So the only thing that matters is the order of the weights. And in fact, even if these are on an ordinal scale, you would get the same minimum spanning tree. Okay. Uh, so, little attention is paid anywhere to these uh, operations research type optimization problems on networks when it comes to meaningfulness. So I want to leave you without meaningfulness of statistical tests, but with the behavioral science examples. Uh, so governments, as you know, are making detailed plans to deal with health events. And uh, we've been interested in bioterrorism, for instance, or naturally occurring diseases like pandemic influenza. A major issue in planning for these disease events and government responses is how people will actually respond during a health emergency. There's a whole field now called epi economic epidemiology, which has a, a major behavioral science component to it. And that is built around how, how people will respond to various kinds of interventions, various kinds of regulations, various kinds of advice. So will they follow instructions to stay home? 
Will critical personnel actually go to work, or will they take care of their families? Will you get immunized if you're told it's a good idea? So uh, in planning for responses to things like swine flu and SARS and foot and mouth disease and some of these other things that have happened over recent years, that's an important piece of the modeling. And it's hard to quantify and hard to measure the variables of interest. Uh, we can learn something from natural disasters. But here are some of the things that I think we need to be able to measure, especially when it comes to epidemiology. Compliance. What does that mean? Willingness to receive treatment or seek it. How much do you believe in the government? How much do you trust the decision makers who are telling you what to do? <coughs> we have to measure the effect of rumor and the perception of risk. When we had SARS uh, in Canada, everybody thought that anyone who was Chinese was going to be a problem. And so the, the economy of Chinatown in New York City was uh, seriously affected. So how do you measure that? Social stigmata, discrimination against social groups. How do you measure panic? How do you measure peer pressure? So the challenge to measurement theory is, when it comes to epidemiology, and maybe for other aspects as well, is how do you bring some of these factors into our models, and how do we measure them, and what kind of statements using measurement are meaningful? So I'll leave you with that and the comment that there's much more analysis of a similar nature that can be done. Lots of challenge for research. And I, I hope if I had a glass, I'd raise it to Jean-Claude <laughs> and wish him uh, many, many more years of productivity and success. And we're very happy to be able to celebrate this with you today. Slide 60. I don't know what it's exactly counted. Decompet. It's just easier for me to say. So what's the question? Well, my question is, well, my question is uh, if you had this uh, product also and you said all these alphas cancel out the Yes. We are not able to observe these alphas. It's just size the surface. The surface of the alphas have some kind of probability distribution. Which alpha you can do is you from some distribution. Yes, yes. Yes, and that and that's just where we get into the. Er the I don't know if it's errors in measurement, but it, you have to bring randomness into measurement theory. And I thought let, we should let Jean Claude answer that question because he's thought about that a lot. But yes, particularly when it comes to something like meaningfulness, yeah, that's a serious. That's a serious issue when it comes to this whole theory. Is, is what happens when uh, a you don't you can't predict what's what people are doing. But B, uh, from the point of view of the analysis, everybody changes their scales by, by a different unit. That doesn't change the analysis that says we could, uh, you know, you could still do this comparison if it's geometric means and you can't do it if it's uh, arithmetic means. So how you actually measure things in practice, that's where this question, I think, arises. Comments, questions? So that's a good, it's, it, 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 the trouble is it get, gets to be counterintuitive because as I pointed out, there are situations where arithmetic mean comparisons are, are meaningful and geometric mean ones are not. So it's not quite that simple.